Today, we are going to test whether AI can write popular television shows better than Hollywood writers. Can AI replicate the craft that goes into writing a scene? Is it possible that AI could replace all Hollywood writers and become the new writer of your favorite television shows? We're gonna find out in this video. AI taking over people's jobs is a huge threat looming over a ton of different professions right now. I actually watched a YouTube video where AI tried to do different people's jobs and a lot of the commenters were saying that the people look like they're threatened by all the AI and what it can do. If a robot was going to unemploy me, take my income and my livelihood, you know I would be threatened and defensive too. And the threat of AI has a chokehold on the Hollywood film industry right now. If you saw my last video, then you would know a little bit about AI and how Hollywood writers are on strike because the WGA is trying to prevent AI from replacing them in their jobs. The striking writers say now is the time to address AI. I mean, they're basically plagiarism machines. We set very specific parameters around it. It cannot be considered literary material. You cannot rewrite with it. Uh, there must be a person associated with it. That will keep it constrained within what it is a tool not an end goal or a creator and if you saw my last video you would know that i made a pretty bold claim that ai could not do the job of a writer they couldn't do it as well and i was thinking michaela have you even tested this have you even tried to see if it actually can write as good as a hollywood writer Today, I'm going to put my bias and my passions aside. I'm going to give my honest, professional opinion. I have been reading scripts for 10 years of my life. Ever since I was nine years old, I know what a good script sounds like. I've been working in this industry for 10 years. I'm also studying screenwriting at USC School of Cinematic Arts, one of the top film schools in the world. So. I think I know how to tell what a good script looks like. It's already hard enough to be an artist and make a living, so AI is just making it even harder. But if you want to support an artist, be sure to subscribe to this channel. I plan and film and edit all of my videos, and it would really mean the world to me if you subscribed and just supported an artist because AI is going to take my job. So Michaela, how in the world are you even gonna test this technology? We are going to read original script scenes from the pilots of three different TV shows. Wednesday, White Lotus, and Succession. Once we've read the scene, I'm gonna go over and tell AI to write a scene and kind of describe what's going on, describe the characters, and we'll see what it does. First, we're going to start with the Netflix hit Wednesday. The series creators are Miles Millar and Alfred Goh. So they must be writing partners. Yeah, they're writing partners because a lot of their credits are the same. They wrote Hannah Montana together, The Mummy. For all the shows that we're reviewing, I'm only going to be reading what's in the pilot scripts just so I don't spoil anything if you guys haven't seen the show stuff from act one nothing very important <laughs> well act one is actually a very important act it's the setup act without it you don't know what's going on okay fade in exterior nancy reagan high school day to establish as all american as hostess cupcakes and the nra the sign out front proudly declares Nancy Reagan High School, home of the Mustangs. You can already see the personality from the first line of the action line, as all American as hostess cupcakes. Interior hallway, Nancy Reagan High School day. Pre-class insanity reigns. Students frantically crisscross the frame through the Technicolor throng of Jansport backpacks and Brandy Millville ensembles. One face stands out, wearing a signature black dress and two perfect braids. Meet Wednesday Adams, 15. Her legendary wit is still sharper than a razor wire, and puberty has amplified her uniquely warped worldview. She cuts a line through her fellow students like a great white through a school of tuna. They really like the similes here. As she walks, she's met with looks of fear or derision, both of which secretly please her. The writer ties in, you know, sharper than a razor wire and then cuts. It, it adds a tone. I'm not sure whose twisted idea it was to put hundreds of adolescents in underfunded schools. <laughs> ran by people whose dreams were crushed years ago, but I admire the sadism. I want you to imagine having to come up with this while I'm reading it. Tr imagine coming up with these words and these ideas. These came from humans because this is harder than it looks. Go try. Up ahead, she sees a group of students gathered around a locker. Muffled screams echo from inside as Wednesday approaches the teens guiltily scatter. Suspicious, she wrenches open the locker door and out tumbles her brother, Pugsley Adams, 13. He's been hogtied with an apple shoved in his mouth. She unsympathetically yanks the apple free. The conciseness of this is also very impressive because a lot of people who are new to writing, they try and explain all that just happened in very long chunks. They get it done like that. Wednesday, I want, I want names. names. Don't know who they were, honest. He begins to blubber. Wednesday's cool demeanor cracks. It happened so fast. Pugsley, emotion equals weakness. Pull yourself together, now. 
But when she grips his shoulders, her head whips back and she experiences a psychic vision. It's liquid and blurred at the edges. In a series of visceral flashes, she sees three teen boys grab Pugsley, tie him up and stuff him in the locker. All wear red and white varsity jackets, emblazoned with the school's stallion mascot and water polo gods printed on the back. The vision ends. The details that are there. And what's really smart is the writer chooses to give this exposition through, you know, visual cues with the vision and all of that stuff instead of, you know, Pugsley saying, oh, these boys beat me up, you know what I mean? Instead of giving exposition through dialogue, which is usually, it doesn't go down well. We don't digest that type of food well. It's hard to swallow. When we see it visually, it's smooth like butter, okay? And that type of exposition is very smart. And that's something that I worry about with AI. I'm not sure if AI will be able to do that much of visual storytelling. I feel like it'll be very on the nose, but we'll see, stay tuned. Pugsley, concerned. Are you okay? okay? Wednesday, nods, collects herself. Leave this to me. Pugsley, even more concerned. Wednesday, what are you going to do? Wednesday, smirks knowingly. What I do best. Off Wednesday, a plan formulating. Mm. Uh, also, a little disclaimer, I have not seen um, Wednesday. Comment down below if I should watch it, if it's worth my time. I know it was really popular. Cut to underwater, looking up at a collection of muscular legs kicking furiously. Camera rises, revealing we are interior swimming pool. Nancy Reagan High School day. I love that transition. Again, it's thinking visually. The camera rises. It's showing the director what you know they need to take from this. So the water polo team is in mid practice. Even in red speedos, these dudes exude smarmy jock entitlement. And another thing about screenwriting that I see all the time is the writer tries to explain like the type of vibe, the energy that you see in everyday life to try and kind of translate to the reader like, you know, how these background actors should be portraying or how they should look. So when you're casting for background actors, Actors, they need to kind of look like this. I don't know if AI will be able to be like, oh, they exude this energy. Like, how do you know what energy is, babe? Like this video and subscribe. You see all that stuff? I gotta edit that. If that subscribe button down there is red, red flag. If it's gray, ooh, we cool, babe. You got good luck. Wednesday emerges from the tunnel under the bleachers and approaches the pool. She scans the players until her eyes lock on the team captain. Dalton. We recognize him as one of Pugley's tormentors from her vision. Dalton regards her mockingly. Dalton. Hey freak, this is a close practice. The others laugh and jeer, but Wednesday remains icily impervious to their taunts. The only person who gets to torture my brother is me. Wednesday pulls her hands from behind her back and holds up two large clear plastic bags, each filled with water and a dozen piranha. With a casual flick of her wrist, she tosses the bags into the water. Dalton's eyes go wide. Flailing chaos erupts as the players frantically swim for the sides. Dalton desperately swims for a ladder. Underwater piranha POV swimming towards him, lured by the white number 23 on his speedos. <laughs> Wednesday, observing the mayhem unfold with the cool detachment of a scientist watching the bikini reef blast. Dalton reaches the ladder, is about to haul himself up. Underwater piranha POV as the leader of the pack zeroes in on the white 23 on Dalton's speed. Off Dalton's unholy, high-pitched scream. Smash cut to main titles. What I love, again, about that whole sequence of action, each uh, action line is basically for, you know, the director to kind of envision we're cutting between Dalton and then the Piranha and then Wednesday. We see each POV as it's going on. Again, it's thinking visually. Also, the creativity of thinking about dropping Piranhas and that is visual exposition as well because it's showing Wednesday is ruthless and she's unsympathetic, maybe even sociopathic. Finding a way, an activity to show her personality rather than somebody being like, you're so mean Wednesday and that on the nose dialogue, which is what I worry about for AI. Now let's see the AI's version. So I just opened up chat jibuta, chat Um, I'm gonna ask it to do something for me. I'm gonna ask it to do something for me. Can you do something for me? Write me a script cold open to a dramatic television show about a girl named Wednesday. She does not fit into the preppy high school crowd. She wears dark colors and has an intimidating demeanor. Wednesday sticks out like a sore thumb. Include a beat where she finds her brother Pugsley tied up in a locker and give exposition about him getting bullied. Wednesday decides to get revenge on her brother's bullies by surprising the bullies at their water polo practice with something dangerous. Send it. Oh, it's writing really quickly. Okay. <laughs> Let's see what it wrote. Oh my gosh, that was really quick. Title, Wednesday's Revenge, Interior High School Hallway Day. The bustling hallway of a preppy high school is filled with students chatting and laughing. Among them, Wednesday, a teenage girl with long dark hair dressed in black from head to toe, stands out like a gothic 
anomaly. Her intimidating demeanor and unique style catch the attention of her peers. It definitely set the environment of the hallway. Um, you know, I just said at school, but it really put us in a location, which is exactly what the writers did. It was in the hallway, I'm pretty sure. I will say that the action line doesn't have as much personality as the writers, you know. It conveyed this information in a very basic way, like saying a preppy high school. Instead, the writers said they're wearing Brandy Melville and Jansport. It's giving very all-American, like the hostess. So using those elements to not exactly say that it's basic, but you know from those brands that it is very basic. It's a smarter way to convey that information without being very on the nose and blunt about it by saying it's a preppy high school. Interior high school locker area, day. Wednesday walks down the quarter, her heavy boots echoing with each step. Okay, including sound. She glances around, observing the students who pass by, whispering and occasionally shooting curious glances in her direction. Wednesday stops in front of a row of lockers, her eyes narrowing as she senses something amiss. I like that, you know, she's sensing something because it's kind of how she had those special senses in the other scene. Through a sliver, in the locker, we catch a glimpse of Pugsley, Wednesday's younger brother, with a disheveled appearance. Fear is evident in his eyes and his mouth is taped shut. Fear is evident in his eyes. No, that, I don't know about that. That's bad to me. Wednesday, whispering to herself, Pugsley? Wednesday wastes no time. She takes a deep breath, her resolve strengthening, and quickly reaches into her backpack, retrieving a small toolkit. With expert precision, she skillfully unlocks the locker, freeing her distressed brother. Yeah, it's, it's too much explaining there. Pugsley relieved. Wednesday, thank goodness you found me. They tied me up and left me here. See what I'm saying about the dialogue exposition? They tied me up here and left me. Like, babe, if we can see visually that you are tied up, you don't need to say it. Wednesday cuts the tape off Pugsley's mouth. If he was talking, then, but he had tape over his, he had a line before that, so how was he talking if there were tape? Okay, whatever. Wednesday angrily. Who did this to you, Pugsley? Pugsley's face falls, his voice trembling. Pugsley nervously. It's the water polo team. They've been tormenting me for weeks. Wednesday's eyes narrow, a dangerous glint reflecting her thirst for justice. <laughs> Wednesday intense. They won't get away with this, Pugsley. I promise you that. We didn't need that line. Smart writers, they'll just be like off her look, you know, and then made that line reflecting a thirst for justice. Cut to, right? Off Wednesday's look, we can already tell that there's something brewing. Exterior, high school pool, day. How did, the real show? Oh, because it's water polo. I was like, wait, how did it know it was at a pool? But I inputted water polo, so they know. Wednesday dressed in her signature dark attire. If we already said the wardrobe and she, it's not a new day, we don't need to re-say it again. Stands near the entrance to the high school pool. The sounds of splashing water and laughing emanate from within. <laughs> Wednesday takes a deep breath, composing herself and reaches into her backpack once again. She pulls out a mysterious object covered in dark cloth and grips it tightly in her hand. Mysterious object. Time to show them the consequences of their actions. You see how the other writers their dialogue had so much personality. This is like infomercial. And I know that you can input even more information for the AI to kind of mold it better to what you want, but we're just going off the first draft. With determination burning in her eyes, Wednesday slowly approaches the glass entrance to the pool area. She pushes the doors open, revealing the unsuspecting water polo team practicing in the pool. The team members turn their heads in surprise, their smiles fading as they witness Wednesday's menacing presence. Wednesday coldly. Surprise boys, let's have some fun. <laughs> As Wednesday steps forward, the camera pans down to reveal what she holds in her hand, a remote control. What? The cloth slips off, revealing a sinister looking device with blinking lights and a faint hum. The water polo team's faces twist into expressions of shock and concern, realizing that Wednesday means business. Fade out. Note the script is a fictional creation for entertainment purposes. Remember to handle sensitive subjects like revenge and dangerous actions with caution and promote positive resolutions in real life situations. So that was the AI scene. Let's review. What did I like about it? I was actually very surprised at how it laid out, you know, the sequence of scenes, the locations and kind of describing the environment. I was very impressed by. Um, what I didn't like or what I wasn't very impressed with, one, the ending, just a random sinister device. Clearly this shows that if you are writing with AI, you really do have to help it out. I'm clearly seeing that this is more of a tool for a writer. As a writer, you still have to put together what is that revenge or what is this, you know what I mean? Because an AI is not gonna do it. It doesn't have that creativity. I will say that the AI seems like it could lay out a very cool structure. 
for, you know, whatever you're writing, but you really have to fill it in, really make it your own, add that flavor, personalize the dialogue so it doesn't just sound boilerplate. Did the AI do better than the actual writers? I would say no. The AI did a first draft version, and granted, this is the first draft that I gave the AI. But now it's time to move on to the next show. The White Lotus Arrivals, episode one, written by Mike White. The genius Mike White, who won an Emmy for writing. Let's read the opening to White Lotus. Fade in, interior airplane, day, Shane, 30s, is handsome, but looks like he's been through the ringer. A flight attendant hands him a cocktail, which he gulps down. Sitting next to him is an older couple. He gulps down the cocktail. That already shows he's in distress. That is already telling us something, not him saying, oh, I'm so stressed out. Thank you, flight attendant. <laughs> like, it's been a long day. I've really been through the ringer. Obviously, this opening scene is different than what was actually printed in the, um, you know, final cut. Sitting next to him is an older couple, older woman. You headed home? She nods absently. Older woman. Us too. I hate the end of things, especially vacations. Older man. What are we going back to? World's gone crazy. Shane forces a curt smile. Mike White is so good with voices. It just sounds real. We were at the Aminari. It was fine. The food was good. Not much to do there, but we just like to sit around anyway. Which hotel were you at? White Lotus. White Lotus? Our guide told us someone was killed there. Shane turns and looks at them gravely. Shane. Bodies on our plane off their reaction. You didn't see them load it on the plane? They shake their heads. Older woman, what is it, on ice or? Older man, what happened? Shane just shakes his head, at a loss. Older woman changes the subject. Well, other than that, did you have a good vacation? The woman smiles. Shane finishes his drink, then. It's my honeymoon. Yeah, congratulations. How wonderful. Was it everything you hoped? <laughs> where's your wife? Yeah, where's your wife? Shane says nothing but the anguished look on his face silences the inquisitive couple. The flight attendant passes. Shane taps her as she passes. Shane mumbles, can I get another drink? Ooh, shoot. The attendant gives a perfunctory nod, heading off. Older man, here, take mine. The older man senses Shane's state, reaches over and drops his cocktail on Shane's tray. Shane doesn't even smile. He just gulps it down as the older couple observes with concern. Shane sets down the empty glass and exhales deeply. The roar of the plane's engine disrupts the moment and we smash cut too. And the fact that he's avoiding the question about the wife, that in itself says so much without saying anything. It allows us, the audience, to put the puzzle pieces together, thinking about the information that we know, the dead body, and that his wife is not there with him. And that also makes us as the audience want to watch more to find out what happened. Now let's see the AI version of White Lotus. Write me an opening scene to a dramatic television show about a man named Shane, who just finished a vacation in Hawaii. The scene takes place on an airplane. Shane looks exhausted, something's weighing on him. He asks a flight attendant for a drink on the flight. A nearby couple of tourists try to chat with Shane about how his vacation was. Shane isn't very open about the experience. Please reveal that Shane was on his honeymoon, there's a dead body on the plane, and that his wife is not sitting next to him on the flight. Send it. Oh, it's really thinking, it's really thinking. Okay, and here it is. Interior airplane cabin day. A weary looking Shane, late 30s, sits by the window in an airplane cabin, his eyes fixed on the passing clouds. The hum of engines fills the air as the plane makes its way through the sky. Shane appears exhausted, the weight of something heavy evident in his expression. A friendly flight attendant approaches wearing a warm smile. I'm seeing a lot of parentheticals right now. And that is a big no-no. You usually don't tell the actor how to act. Usually your line of dialogue should kind of be a signal to the tone. Because as you see in the White Lotus script, there's barely any parentheticals. Only when there's a shift or really something important, but not directing the actor. This is directing the actor, which is not good. Flight attendant, cheerfully. Good afternoon, sir. How can I assist you? Shane, gently. Could I have a drink, please? Something strong, if you don't mind. That's good. That's good. AI really picked up that he needed something strong, that he's stressed out. That was a good line. Flight attendant nods, understanding the unspoken request for solace and heads toward the beverage cart. Across the aisle, a jovial couple of tourists, early 40s, glance in Shane's direction, their faces still sun-kissed from a tropical vacation. Okay, I like that. Excitedly, oh God, these parentheticals. Oh my gosh, there's more parentheticals. Hey there, just got back from Hawaii ourselves. How's your trip, buddy? It's bad dialogue, but it's also like the tourists being annoying 
which is good for the scene in a way because Shane clearly doesn't want to deal with anything. So in a way that is kind of a good choice, having the characters be completely opposite, more fuel for Shane to get more stressed out. It's bad dialogue, but it works right now, if that makes sense. Shane, monotone, it was fine. Taurus woman grinning, oh, come on, Hawaii is paradise. You must have had a blast. Shane's eyes drift toward the empty seat behind him, where his wife should have been sitting. He clenches his jaw, his knuckles turning white. Okay, so that's also an error. Film and television is a visual medium. Just because you said in an action line, a very important thing about where his wife should have been sitting, nobody, when this is on screen, can read that action line. So nobody's gonna know based off a look that he thinks his wife should be sitting there. That's a problem, because that's a very important information that nobody will see. Only the reader of the script will see. You know what I mean? That's more like novel writing, not screenwriting. Shane, softly. Yeah, paradise for some. The flight attendant returns, placing a drink in front of Shane. He nods in appreciation, takes a long, contemplative sip. As the plane shakes slightly, revealing hidden turbulence, the atmosphere grows tense. A commotion arises from the rear of the cabin, causing heads to turn. Shane's eyes widen as he notices the commotion, his heart pounding in his chest. He glances back, spotting a group of panicked passengers huddled around something. His gaze fixates on a dead body covered in a blanket carried by two flight attendants making their way through the cabin. The reality of the situation hits him hard, his mind racing with disbelief. Shane's hands tremble, causing his drink to spill, but he barely notices. He searches the cabin frantically, desperately trying to find his wife, but she's nowhere in sight. The realization draws upon Shane's face, an ominous storm brewing within him, overshadowing the paradise he had just left behind. Fade out. Wow, very dramatic at the end. Um, my camera died. We have my vlog camera, which is a very wide angle lens, but I guess you guys can see a little bit more of like what's going on. Let's get into what I liked about the scene. The AI was able to make it arc. You know, it wasn't a stagnant scene. Something happened at the end um, and things changed. So I did really enjoy that. I also liked, um, you know, the first part with Shane and the drink. What I wasn't very impressed by, it feels very, Rose. It feels very novel-like. There's too many action lines and that's a trend. There's way too many parentheticals, which is a huge, no, 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 no. I also really like how it came to the conclusion that, you know, the realization that that's his wife. Like it was able to allow us to put the puzzle pieces together like Mike White did about thinking, well, the wife is gone and then, oh, there's a dead body. Except we as the audience wouldn't know that the wife is gone because he never said it, you know what I mean? Like it was just an action line and there was no way for us to tell because we're not reading a script, we're watching the TV show. But yeah, an ominous storm brewing within him, overshadowing the parrot, like that, all that would be like off Shane's look. We, you know what I mean? It'd be like something like that, like really short. Did AI write White Lotus better than Mike White? In my opinion, it did not. Lastly, we're going to look at Succession. The pilot script of Succession written by Jesse Armstrong. Interior room night. Black. The unsteady POV of someone groping through a darkened room, hands out ahead. Bang, a wall. The writer's really putting us in the scene. The figure we're following wasn't expecting that. Hands flat against the wall, hand over hand looking for an opening. Oh my gosh! Even the choice of the writer using fragments, fragmented sentences, adds to that kind of like disillusion, right? Y'all don't understand, I'm a nerd. I'm a nerd, okay? I'm grateful that you're watching this far, to be honest. Logan, where the f am I? Okay, here's the opening our figure was seeking. Marcia, off screen. Logan, I it's okay, Logan. Our guy is in somewhere now into the room he was seeking. Okay, everything is okay. He knows what he's doing now. Logan to himself, ugh, okay, okay. The shuffle of bedclothes as Marcia climbs out of bed. Then we hear the sound of, what? Water dripping onto something soft and then boom, lights on and all is bright and stark and sudden. And what do we have? An 80 year old man, Logan Roy, in his shorts and t-shirt pissing towards a laundry basket in a walk-in wardrobe lined with freshly arrived suits and shirts. Dark urine stutters across the deep white pile of thick carpet, dampening it down like hot piss on wet snow. <sighs> I stand in solidarity with the WGA. Keep these writers, keep these writers. Logan is momentarily terrified, but then a younger woman, early 50s, is in the doorway. Her hands across her nakedness, pulling something on. It's okay, Logan, where am I? Marcia, it's okay, we're in the new place. It's okay, Logan, New York. 
3.12 a.m. He computes this information as we cut from Logan's rebooting face too. And that's the opening scene from Succession. It's so hard also for me as a creative to like explain what the writer's doing when I see it, especially because I've been reading scripts for so long. It's just good. And you know, I'm gonna leave it at that. Now let's see the AI version of Succession. Write me an opening scene to a dramatic television show about an old man who wakes up in the middle of the night looking for a bathroom in the dark. He struggles to find the bathroom and ends up peeing on the floor of a closet. When the lights turn on, we can tell that the man lives a life of luxury based on the New York City apartment and clothes in the closet. Include a beat where his spouse helps him out of the situation. Interior, luxury New York City apartment, bedroom, night. A spacious bedroom, elegantly decorated with rich fabrics and tasteful artwork. Moonlight filters through the sheer curtains, casting a soft glow on the room. In the dimly lit space, we see an elderly man, John, 70s, dignified yet frail, stirring in his sleep. His eyes flutter open and he squints into the darkness, disoriented. John, grumbling, mm, gotta find the bathroom. <sighs> So again, it's on the nose, but what did we expect from AI? He slowly sits up, his movements tentative, as if the weight of age burdens him. John reaches for his spectacles on the nightstand and puts them on. He swings his leg over the side of the bed and gingerly places his feet on the plush carpet. Exterior luxury New York City apartment hallway night? So we're outside? Uh... John shuffles through the bedroom door into a grand hallway adorned with intricate paintings and antique furniture. His eyesight, hindered by the lack of light, strains to make out his surroundings. John, muttering, which way is it? He hesitates, then starts down the hallway, his steps slow and unsure. As he walks, his grip tightens on the edge of his bathrobe, his knuckles turning white. Interior, New York City luxury apartment, walk-in closet, night. John pushes open a door, thinking it leads to the bathroom. Instead, he stumbles into a closet filled with designer clothes and expensive accessories. He squints, trying to make sense of his mistake. Okay, what in the world? Unaware of his surroundings, John fumbles with the tie of his bathrobe, thinking it's the bathroom's light switch. He unties it and lets the robe fall open, standing exposed in the opulent closet. Suddenly, the lights snap on, revealing the grandeur of the space. John's eyes widen in realization and embarrassment as he discovers his mistake. Interior New York City luxury apartment closet night. This is really long. John's spouse, Elizabeth, late 60s, elegant, compassionate, stands in the doorway wearing a satin robe. She looks at John, a mixture of amusement and concern on her face. Elizabeth, teasingly, these freaking parentheticals. Darling, I think you've taken a wrong turn. John's face reddens, and he tries to cover himself, hastily wrapping the bathrobe around his body. Elizabeth walks toward him, a gentle smile playing on her lips. Elizabeth, softly. Come on, dear, let's get you to the bathroom. Just take out the action line and just have it, Elizabeth. Darling, I think you've taken a wrong turn. Come on, let's get you to the bathroom. That's it! You don't need all of this stuff, it's too much! Elizabeth takes John's hand and leads him out of the closet, guiding him through the hallway, her touch comforting and familiar. The scene fades out, leaving us with a sense of the elderly couple's enduring love and the challenges they face together in their world of luxury and aging. Yeah. Who did it better, AI or Jesse Armstrong? We don't even need an explanation, guys. For this specific scene, I didn't like anything. I'm sorry. I didn't like anything of this, but tell me if I'm wrong. Leave a comment down below. Am I wrong? In conclusion, do I think AI can write better than Hollywood television writers? No. Was I impressed with the AI? Yeah, I was actually really impressed at how quickly it could create a scene with actually some of the arcs of the scenes and the way it was able to describe different environments and characters. But I definitely can tell that it needs the hand of a writer. It needs the creativity of a human. It also includes a lot of screenwriting faux pas, overuse of parentheticals, and way too many action lines that break up the flow of dialogue. It's just over descriptive, way too descriptive. To me, right now, seems kind of like a tool that writers can use in the process of screenwriting. AI is constantly getting better, and this was already pretty good. Like, AI can do a job, maybe not a good one. It maybe can write a better pilot than The Idol. <laughs> yes, Shade Throne, Sam Levinson, what was that? I don't think AI can do the job alone. Clearly, I mean, it needs a human to input the information. I don't think you'd be able to sell it. I don't think you'd have a reader, you know, reading through it that long. 
you keep the reader invested through the tone and through the style and you know through just having smart storytelling and the unfolding of events this it was really boring to read a lot of the ai stuff because it again lacked that personality do i think that ai will unemploy all writers it's possible why because of what's going on in hollywood the greed of um you know certain studios and big corporations and you know they'll want to make content make it badly but it's you know easier if an ai thing can do it really quickly than them just kind of trying to make a, a quick book because well we produced it we filmed it blah, blah blah who cares if it's badly written it looks interesting and people will watch it and buy it but then they'll be disappointed it's uh it's it sucks that you know ai could possibly take over jobs because as you can see it's the work of an artist and it sucks that ai poses a threat to artists' jobs. It's already hard enough to make a living as an artist, but I'm very glad that the writers are striking and they're trying to get a contract that helps them protect their rights. If you also want to support me, an artist who just finished editing this whole entire video, I already know it's gonna be a pain, and who's in college for screenwriting, learning about this craft. As you can see, I'm very passionate about this. Keep watching my videos, it really helps. You watching this video, your views, helps me as a creative monetarily. Um, so thank you for watching till the end. And if you stay till the end, comment the word spider to go with the Wednesday theme, a little creepy crawly. And be sure to subscribe. I will be posting the writer strike vlog next. That is my next upload. So stay tuned for that. Like this video if you enjoyed it. I will see you guys in the next one.